Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for our very first um, Art in Process session of 2022. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, schedule lined up, and um, I don't want to take too much time now because we have a lot to get through with our three speakers today. Um, um, but we're all very excited about um, uh, this session that Aniko Such has um, helped organize for us. And um, I, at this point, I'm just going to turn things directly over to Aniko so we can we can move straight into the into the session. Aniko, take it away. Thank you so much, Kevin. And yes, I actually would like to start by thanking you and thanking the Beinecke Book Library and, Manus uh, Book, uh, Manus and Manuscript Library for offering us this great platform to hold this event. Um, this truly spectacular series, which is the art and protest series that Kevin creates actually started exactly when the free SFA movement started in Budapest. We're talking about the fall, early fall of 2020. And ever since uh, Kevin has started to facilitate these events, it really truly has been my dream to to hold one session that would focus on what happened, what happened in Budapest in 2020 and has been happening since because it is such a spectacular, beautiful protest movement uh, that evolved from uh, this attempted and unfortunately unsuccessful uh, overtake of the university that it, it, it's definitely, there are some lessons that we can all learn from it. So again, thank you. And also thank you for the participants, three truly wonderful participants who are joining us. Now to make this uh, event um, comprehensive, I will just give, give you a sense of um, how we are going, going to structure our speakers. So first we're gonna, I'm gonna start by showing you a short film that gives you a sense of the very feeling of how, the, how these protest movements in 2020 started and, um, and the kind of energy with which both, both the faculty and the students and then the larger uh, audience in, it's in Hungary joined the event. Um, then we will have our sp three speakers speaking consecutively. And after their, after their individual speeches, we hope to have a, a great and vibrant conversation with, with all of us together. Please write your questions into the Q&A and I will carefully follow them. Um, further, I will also try to share some visual materials with you as our speakers are speaking so that you can get an even better sense of, uh, of again, these extremely performative, extremely embodied and exciting events that took place and, and still in some shapes and form are taking place in Budapest. So with that said, let me introduce you the three speakers. I will introduce all three of them just now so that then again, we can move on to the film and the, and the individual presentations or talks. Um, our first speaker today will be Laszlo Upor, who is a Hungarian dramaturg, literary translator, essayist, and university professor. Laszlo is a special, Laszlo specialized mostly in contemporary drama and performing arts. As a dramaturg, he has worked with most of the leading mainstream companies in Hungary, but also with several independent artists, physical and puppet theaters. He spent several months, about two years altogether, as resident dramaturg at the literary departments of major theaters in London, New York, and Dublin. His translations include novels, nonfiction, and over 50 stage plays. He has published two books and numerous articles on theater, film, and contemporary circus. Uh, Laszlo is the former vice rector or uh, vice dean uh, and then acting rector, which is a really interesting uh, title I hope he'll address, of the University of Theatre and Film Arts in Budapest, where he had been teaching for over three decades. His international activity includes conferences, workshops, and university courses, as well as collaboration with theatre companies in Europe and in the US. Our second speaker will be Ildiko Enedi, awards winner and Oscar-nominated film director who studied her career as a concept and media artist. She was a member of the art group Indigo and the Balazs Vila studio, studio, the only independent film studio in Eastern Europe before 1989. She later turned to feature film directing and script writing, wrote and directed six features and several shorts. With these works, she's won more than 50 international prizes. Her film, My 20th Century, was chosen as one of the 12 best Hungarian films of all time and selected among the 10 best films of the year by the New York Times. 
In addition to prizes awarded to her as a filmmaker, she has also received recognition as a scriptwriter, such as winner of the Grand Prize of the Hartley Marial International Screenwriting Prize. She lectures at European masterclasses Switzerland and Poland, for instance, and was a professor habilitated of film directing at the University of Film and Theatrical Arts in Budapest. After the university was deprived of its academic, academic and autonomy, she became a founding member of Free SFA, an independent creative hub and association for learning and teaching. She was also a member, she was also a member of Majory in at Berlin, Venice, Moscow, and San Sebastian Film Festival, among others. She was uh, awarded the Balash Bill and the Merited Artist Prizes and has received the Republic's President's Order of Merit Cross. She is a member of the European and the American Film Academy, a mother of two. She lives in Budapest. And lastly, Nora Ayeski studied television production at SFA at the University of Film and Theatrical Arts. As the student, as the student occupa occupation of the university broke out in 2020, she was just returning back to campus to continue her television production studies after a passive year she spent finishing her law degree. Her role became coordinating between the students and the pro bono legal experts who offered their help. Again, a very interesting topic that we'll touch upon, like this kind of the intertwine of legal aspects and then also the protest movement. The freedom fight and its legal course impacted her profoundly. She quit studying television production for law and now works as a legal officer in the political freedoms project of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union while pursuing PhD studies in the field of constitutional law at Utrecht Lorand University, Budapest. So the, these will be our speakers, thanks to all three of you. And as I mentioned before, I will start by sharing my screen and show you a really powerful and interesting short film uh, that, that captures the spirit of this movement. Mi, egyetemi polgárok nem akarjuk, hogy az évtizedek óta a színház és filmművészeti egyetemen dolgozók helyett olyan emberek határozzák meg a jövőnket, akik nem kíváncsiak ránk. Autonóm jogainkért a végsőkig kiállunk! Mi, a színház és filmművészeti egyetem hallgatói azon dolgozunk, hogy tájékozottak és érzékenyek legyünk, hogy értsük a világ és az ember működését. A kultúra közkét semmilyen csoport nem sajátíthatja ki! Nincsenek illúzióink a felől, hogy a hatalom békhez viszi, amit eltervezett. Ilyen a hatalom természete. Nő, mint a gömböc, dagad, tágul, mindent bekebelez, ami az útjába kerül. Aztán egyszer csak megreped és szétrobban. Meg fogjuk érni, amikor a hatalom kipukkad, és végre újra szabadon művelhetjük a kultúrát. Kiállunk a szabad felsőoktatásért! Thank you. So with that, I would like to pass the baton to uh, Laszlo Por, uh, as I mentioned, dramaturg translator. So Lassi, tell us a little bit the whole process. And I asked, actually, I asked Lassi to give us a, a comprehensive summary of, of the events that took place between the very beginning or even what preceded the movement and today. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank and you. just, sorry, I'm just out of conveniency. I will actually uh, share my screen now because at a certain point I will share some images with uh, with the presentation. So uh, let me do it now so that I don't have to interrupt you later. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. It's not very easy to to start uh, speaking up this little uh, video. But as we agreed, I, I accepted the role of the boring history teacher. So let, let me give everyone a little uh, summary of the last two years. Now the three speakers uh, present here and the faces you saw on the video, we all work for this uh, free society, free SFA. Uh, the, this ugly and beautiful story started two years ago. And of course, uh, it was preceded with so many other events, but I won't go back in time to 
so long. Anyway, two years ago, when I was the leader of this school, we were uh, told, we were announced that uh, the, the university ha has to go through a forced and very urgent transformation, uh, not asked for by the community of, of, the, of the university. We all felt our uh, autonomy and academic freedom in jeopardy. So we put up a fight, uh, the leaders, the staff, and the students of the university. And this fight went on from February 2020 until the end of summer, until the last day of August, when in a very, very dramatic moment, the whole leadership of the university resigned. That same night, the students of the university occupied the building and kept it under blockade for 71 days until they have to leave the, uh, the buildings because of the COVID situation. Both during the first half year of, of our fight and during the fights after uh, and during the blockade, the, the teachers, uh, the, the teaching staff and the, the, the students work in unison. And as you can see on the pictures, or at least you, have, you can have some idea uh, watching the, the pictures, this whole movement was uh, exceptionally um, um, theatrical. It was full of wonderful performative actions. Uh, so while the first half year was dominated by the administrative fight of, of the teaching staff and the leaders, paralleled with wonderful actions by the students, this second, this second phase of protest was dominated by the students' actions and self-organizing, uh, self-conducted fight with the help of, of the leaders of the university. In November 2020, the students, um, the community had to leave the buildings because of the COVID situation. Um, this, I, I hope we can at, at some point uh, explain what you can see on this picture, but let, let me go on. So in November, the students had to, to leave the building and we, uh, we followed our fight together until the end of the first semester, when about half of the teachers and the students left the university and uh, established our free learning society, free creative society, free SFF. And uh, we teamed up with five European universities who uh, agreed on adopting our courses, our students. So our students, students of the free SFF society are officially inscribed to five European universities but uh, with an agreement with us that the teachers of the SFA uh, uh, society will go on teaching the students who are officially, as I said, um, students at those universities. But this is not the end of the story. We are, uh, we are building something new, something that uh, revives uh, and, and forwards the, the tradition of our old institution that was a 150 year old institution with a wonderful lineup uh, of uh, alumni, including Theodico. So I stop here my, my short history lesson and I hope to get the word back later. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to come back to so many things that you just mentioned now. Thank you so much. And now uh, I would like to ask Ildi Kuo and the film director again, a professor, to tell us a little bit about your experiences and some of your reflections of what happened in 2020 and 2021. Um, I would start perhaps uh, uh, with what happened before. Uh, our university was very, very uh, strongly underfinanced and uh, attacked uh, during years beforehand. And um, it's a tiny, tiny university, but especially um, successful um, regarding the, um, the output, uh, how the, the former students uh, achieved later. Um, and um, somehow uh, we were, quite often on the verge of giving up. Um, 
sometimes we had to close the school uh, in the winter because we had no money for the heating. And um, this sort of um, poor uh, way of uh, working made somehow um, created a, a very close, um, very tight, very intense uh, community. Um, because really everyone who was there, students and the teachers, they were there because they were passionate about about theater or about film. And um, uh, during the difficulties, we didn't really feel uh, um, the value of this sort of community. Um, and during the, the occupation of the university, uh, somehow it's the performance of the, uh, of the students, uh, their organizations, their fantasy, the quality, of uh, of these um, uh, artistic uh, events, performances, uh, show the, what we achieved beforehand and we were not really aware of it. So somehow that's one of the very positive aspects of what happened that we, we realized finally um, the treasure of what we have. Um, the other um, aspect, um, what was a very, very positive uh, experience for me and the long lasting positive experience, uh, even we lost the buildings, we lost, we lost a lot, um, was that sort of uh, relentless, uh, focused clarity and articulate communication of the students um, to every provocation, to every attack, um, which was a quite unique um, way of communicating uh, in, in the world of today, where um, very different parties, not just in Hungary, not just in Eastern Europe, all over the world, are communicating rather with uh, emotions, gut feelings, um, uh, outlashing, uh, inarticulate um, um, uh, hatred um, or impatience. And uh, whatever happened, these students never ever um, entered uh, in in, in these sort of traps, uh, which really dominate uh, today's uh, public uh, conversation. So somehow they show the a sort of example how we should actually uh, deal with, with the questions of our, our life in, in society. And uh, all this, what is a real miracle, <laughs> they achieved um, in a base democratic way, which is the most maddening, most tiring, most difficult thing to do in a process where every day they have to just discover new and new challenges and they had to find new and new answers. Um, in such a tense situation, they never gave up to, uh, to the principle to make every decision on uh, the base of a basic, uh, base democratic uh, voting. So it was quite often uh, a very puzzling um, um, also for, for those who attacked us and also for those sometimes who wanted to support us, but who are the leaders? who will decide, who will tell us yes or no. And all the time they just said, yeah, tonight we will have a meeting and we will vote and that will be the, uh, the decision. So in this very, very difficult and, and chaotic way with, with so many people, uh, somehow through the patient discussions, 
they always um, arrived to a very clear, a very consistent message uh, for the outside world. I, I find it really miraculous. <laughs> and, uh, and here I do really would like to give the word to, um, to Nori who had a huge chunk uh, to assure this sort of clarity in the communication. Thank you so much, Eric. And yes, that's really great because this was one of the things that I actually asked Nori to talk about because from the outside, it was this really mysterious uh, process of decision making and of self governing body that was built in front of our very eyes, but we did not have any access to it. Even as, an, as a former student, I, we just kind of heard about it and it, it really sounded truly fun, uh, wonderful. Now, um, when I approached Nori, I asked her to talk about both uh, these internal decision making and legal decisions as well as a little bit more of how these very creative young artists staged the many different performances that took place during those three months. And for that reason, we all we agreed that we would again insert a short video clip just again so that you can see another event that the students staged. It is the it is it was a live chain through which the about 10,000 people handed handed the carta, the university's carta to the parliament. And uh, so let me switch, share my videos again and, and let's just look at a little bit of that and then Nori can tell us about these creative processes uh, through which we arrived to, uh, to such um, spectacular events. You can see the carta has arrived to the university. Uh, I'm sorry, to the parliament, of course, from the university. So thank you so, so thank you so much, and Nori, go ahead. I'll take it away. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your um, kind words, um, Ildiko. I would like to just start where where you ended with the with the um, dedication and the intense bond you've talked about that this university um, created or rather the community of this university created. So from the student perspective, this university was really a dream for, for every young, um, young student who wanted to become an artist in the field of theater and, and film. This was the dream to get into this university. And once you uh, got the chance and you applied and got in, it, it, it was really something that um, that you, that built dedication inside, and there were how to say it, just you know um, little classes with with few students, like ten to the maximum, and they, these um, these groups really became um, more like families, you know, like really strong friendship bonds were created, and. Um, this dedication it also went on to mastering art skills so it took uh we we really took it to the to the extreme like university work was was our whole life during those years and i think this was the number one aspect that was um was kind of the the heart of of, of our protest and our demonstration and the second one is um what Aniko just mentioned that we came from different fields of art, you know, from visual designers to direct 
sculptors to uh, puppetry artists, um, all kinds of all kinds of people with with um, with art interests were in there. So um, when we were occupying the university for seventy one days, you know that's that's a lot to fill in with creative ideas and you know as um, as hor horrible decisions were made. Um, up, up from, about us uh, from the so-called leaders of the university. Um, it also gave us this um, this way to to rather than just fighting back, uh, fill this space with with creative and and positive messages and and um, events that people can interact with. And one of the most wonderful thing was that so many people uh, came up to our universities. Um, when the occupation happened, there were guards, you know, student guards and also teachers were stepping up every hour of the day. And that was at the gate of our university where people, um, just people crossing by the street where they could meet us, you know, and all of the stories that they're telling that we are giving them hope actually to, there's, there are really values worth standing up for. And it, it was one of the, the great uh, things to remember how people could really um, get, um, get to connect to our values. And the third one is social sensitivity as, as performing arts, um, I, I, we found that and we talked about that a lot, that um, it's really throughout these years we are, we, are, um, we are performing in a way always reflective to society. So um, when we were using our studies, this kind of led us to really create this direct democracy that Ildiko was talking about. And instead of you know practicing uh, plays and uh, shooting movies in every every minute of our time that we had, we were creating long hour forums um, in our main hall, the Audrey stage. Um, yes, thank you very much, um, Aniko. So you can imagine this whole stage and this whole auditorium just filled with all of the students discussing what to do next, what to, how to stand up as a community. And yes, one, pe one person, one vote. Um, one of the, the idea and vision of this university was that it's not a hierarchical um, university. It was really a community in the sense of how, um, you know, the the Bologna Carta declares that the, the university is a community of teachers, students, and faculty, and we, and we really lived that. Um, you know, everyone had one vote on the things, and everyone could um, break down. The community was breaking down into little working groups. You can join a working group each day. There's working groups for moderators organizing the forums, working group for people who are doing the performative actions. They, they were the, the, the hub where the, where the ideas happened. But if you had a great idea that you wanted to do and perform, that was great. You kind of just um, told it to the forum that night and we were discussing it. And what was really great about that, that whenever an idea popped, there were 10, 20, 50 people backing it up and organizing to make it happen. There was never a moment where, you know, these performances had like a, a lot of people, you know, doing all kinds of works and operative tasks to get there. And these people, these these artists, they didn't just think about the, you know, um, the art and the vision. They also had to back it up. And we were we were backing each other up because we had um, trust in each other. And that was also something that was created throughout the years of university. This trust, um, this um, this sense of togetherness, um, and that's that's really what just um, what just made made us even stronger when we really had to rely on each other and also the the legal aspects i'm not going to talk about it a lot if you're interested we can maybe return it to later i'm just just to uh, outline it that it started with protests in the summer and just to tell you that really it turned into civil obedience once we occupied the university so there were really harsh conditions when uh, electricity you know and, and heating and internet was ripped off but we still like the auditorium there was um they, they dimmed the lights so that we could not really see each other and they um they, they thought that if we lose internet connection we are not able to communicate with each other and then the supporters the civil su supporters gave us internet connection so um it was just really some examples to wrap it up and um also i would uh, like to then uh, return to the symbols that uh, we created because um, it, throughout these performative actions, there were really a lot of them. Um, what was common is uh, there were some symbols that we really um, 
if we really used and maybe um, probably the ribbon, the red and white ribbon is the most famous that, that you might know um, that we, we used and still continue to use uh, throughout our uh, performances. And then there was the mask, because obviously COVID um, hit in 2020, and it was just a great way also where people can, um, where, where our supporters really could join us and standing up together. And let me tell you, it was great. Like after a um, whole night of forum, um, we were really tired and then just going back to the university and seeing people wearing the masks that we created, people, ordinary people who are supporting us, um, it was really a, a sense of uh, togetherness as a whole. And, and here you can see our civil supporters. They sent us uh, pictures. They uh, sent us, you know, they baked cakes for us. They they really did everything back, backing us up. And also um, you could see that there were guards um, in, in the roof of the university. That, yes, thank you very much, Aniko. And here students and famous actors and famous uh, art people uh, came to stand and show the solidarity. And, you know, in every 30 minutes, there were someone up and people could, could see that, that they are the ones representing us and they are the ones who, who st stand up for us for um, word by word. So um, those were another one. Another one is a torch. You could see the torch uh, throughout our performances. And there was just one really uh, great event when we said goodbye to our lawfully um, elected <laughs> rector, Laszlo Por, and, um, and, and our real uh, leaders. So they passed on the torch to the students. And then the students came to this uh, massive square where even more students joined. And um, this is really the torch of autonomy that we still try to light. And I will stop right here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you. And I we would like to continue to encourage everyone to put your questions into the Q&A. We will try to get to as many as possible. So far, we have two. And we're going to get to both of them in a second. Uh, there is one larger question that I would like to, I would like us to address before we go to the individual questions, which is uh, because uh, I would like us to get a to give a good sense of why this was such a powerful movement in Hungary and how it stood for, it almost it stood as a metaphor for what's happening. So what's happening or what is not happening in Hungary right now in, in this regime that's that's been quite oppressively ruling for, for 12 years now. And um, and so even if we go back to the very beginning of this, of the negotiation of the process, so how can we better understand some of the, like some of the larger processes that are political processes that are happening in the country? Um, let's see, maybe, could you start? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, as a reference to what, what Ildiko said before, there had been a, a so-called cultural war going on for a long, long time. And our university had been attacked for a long time. And the new leaders of the university uh, who were appointed by the government, uh, handpicked by the prime minister, were actually the people who had been attacking for uh, us for a long time. And that, that was one thing. But there, that, there's two things uh, parallel. One that hits all the Hungarian universities that are taken over by, by governmental people uh, uh, by a board that is appointed for life. And in our case, that was combined with the cultural war. But I don't want to get into that. Uh, answering your question, Oniko, I think the, the secret, which is an open secret known by everyone, is that uh, this, this movement of ours was, was highly supported by Hungarian and international audiences, I think, for, for several reasons. But the, the main points are the clarity, as, as Ildiko uh, explained earlier, the clarity of the statements, uh, the transparency, which is very important, uh, the unity of the of the uh, students and staff, which I think is, is unique, and and also the performativity. And if you if you give me two minutes, I just uh, try and explain how the, this extremely long series of per performing actions could could lead to the uh, to the demonstration in October that was attended by over 30,000 people. Over 30,000 people uh, protested, demonstrated on the streets uh, in October last year, uh, uh, 
I mean, 2020, 20, and it was all uh, started by a small university of 500. Now, just just give you one example. If if you could uh, give us back the the image with with the torches on on Ico, let, let me explain what happened there. Uh, uh, Nora already explained that there were guards on that roof uh, above the 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 entrance, and that was the night when when the students uh, said us. Uh, goodbye. The people on the roof is uh, the the ex leaders of the university, the uh, resigned leaders of the university. We were said goodbye by the students giving each of us a torch, and me standing on the right uh, edge of, of of the roof, I had to uh, had to uh, light that flame next to my uh, leg, and that flame was the the flame of freedom. And the very next day, other people came, students came and lit their torches from that flame and started running to seven uh, different um, uh, target cities in Hungary to run with, 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 the, with, with, uh, with the fire of freedom and uh, giving seven universities our, uh, uh, our fire of freedom. So this is uh, how the chain uh, the chain of performative events went through the whole movement. Uh, you know, I could I could go on for two weeks and 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 listing wonderful performative events, but I think I hope that this this one moment can can give you an idea how one thing would lead to the next and how the creativity of the students raised attention and support from the audience. Basically. The, the the opponent uh, sides were the very arrogant government uh, forces and the innocent, nice, creative, non-arrogant students. And I think this is how they won the the fight, even uh, when we lost everything. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it would be interesting to go from so so how we arrived to this point to then what happened since then. So thank you, Stefan, for your question, which is what is the current situation? How can we help? And so I was wondering if, uh, if maybe I don't know, Ildiko, would you feel comfortable just to tell us a little bit uh, what's happening today? Uh, I, there are some of the classes that are now part of the free SFS society. So just uh, give us a little update. Thank you. Um, just before answering, uh, perhaps uh, I just clarify one more aspect. Uh, what happened is not just to change uh, um, the leaders of the university, um, not just to take away the uh, authority of the Senate, but um, these universities in Hungary, um, they are public universities built and made function by the money of the taxpayers. Uh, and these became private universities um, from one moment to the other. So um, um, given just like uh, cookies or presents um, to, um, to to uh, certain uh, very small groups uh, close to the uh, government. So I imagine if anyone wants to found a private university, fine, wonderful. Uh, it happens all over the world. I think it's it's great. Um, um, then you have to, to get the money for that and, and fund the university. Here, it was taken away from everyone, from all of us, and, and given to, uh, to specified groups. Um, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> we are uh, in, in the free SFM, uh, we are uh, uh, focusing on two directions. It's a creative hub. Um, one of uh, the aspects of, of the, uh, the events of 2020, what we haven't spoken about was to found a so-called so learning republic. Um, so it was um, 
um, it was really not just occupying uh, the university, resisting and articulating uh, what we are not uh, uh, agreeing to, but uh, meanwhile, uh, never stopping um, to, to teach and learn. And uh, the ethos of this sort of learning republic, that's uh, what we want to continue. And in, in the free SFR, uh, we uh, created a creative hub on one side, and uh, we want to follow the, um, the previously designed curriculums of, of many uh, existing classes and assure them for them a diploma. And perhaps Nori can speak about um, um, those wonderful, wonderful European universities who were solidarity with us and who uh, in a way adopted these classes and can give them um, um, the same um, diploma as uh, they would have uh, given if they stayed in the old SFR. So Nore, do you want to join, step in? Sure, thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's a great topic to talk about. Um, it's, it's a program called the emergency exit. And it really is for us, you know, students who didn't want to, um, or really just um, didn't want to continue their studies over this new kind of leadership and could have the possibility to, to quit, to have an emergency exit. Well, this is what, um, what, uh, what our teachers and our students who were working for months for this made happen. And this is what happened because the European universities that offered a helping hand for us were in to help. So it is a partnership because, you know, um, they knew they, we had good relations, the universities uh, with our international cooperation before. And now when really the danger hit, they were there for us um, with open arms. And it is really a wonderful uh, gift for us to do and um it, it's really legally you know it's also very interesting like people in in hungary also this new leadership was convinced that it cannot be happen because just you know the hungarian regulation could um accept diplomas for hungarian students and actually the chancellor uh, wrote letters to the european universities to not to stop to stop this program and stop um giving diplomas to hungarian students but obviously he couldn't stop it. So this is happening. And, um, and in, in May, there was a great um, celebration of these emergency exit diplomas. And it's really just something that solidarity, partnership and cooperation can really lift uh, people up and we can, um, we can move on and move up from this um, authoritative um, style that we are you know, um, uh, living in. And there is also a room for uh, peace and um, solidarity and freedom. And this is really what free as a society represents. It's, it's, um, it's some fresh air for everyone. And this is why, um, why we, ha we have to do it. We have to move forward. And there's every other day, there's someone stepping by our side and, and helping, even when um, you know, it's very, very dark and we cannot see possibilities. It's, it's really true that it's always darkest before the dawn. There's always a someone and some new possibility to, to clear it up, clear up the way. And also this is with, with our legal cases as well, um, that uh, we are still continuing all those lawsuits, you know, between the, there's this constitutional court that, that really just refuses to give any word on the law that turned the university into a private university. They're probably just gonna wait um, until it doesn't matter anymore to them. They can do this because there's no time limit for them. But the judges that, um, that deal with our cases, you know, there are some wins. When, when the new leadership actually banned education, they did that. They did that three times to try to stop our, our movement. Um, first, they forced us to, you know, autumn breaks, <laughs> like they could stop it. They couldn't, obviously, but then really banned it. And judges and courts said that, no, it has to be lifted. This order cannot uh, prevail. So they, could, they couldn't. And the culture war side of that is also, I think, because 
um, it's relevant in this case because when the judges ordered uh, to the possibility for us to continue our studies, there the government made a regulation. You know, in, in in we are in a state of danger in Hungary now because of the COVID, and in a state of danger, the government can basically do whatever they want, and they may, they issue the government decree that um, as well. Um, the Hungarian um, educational law gives the possibility for when the student government um, intervenes that um, that um, that the leadership is ordered that are hurting the students can be uh, lifted. So the government decree said that well, it's a, it's a fine option. It doesn't available anymore because it's a state of danger. It was this this government decree was clearly to uh, rip us the possibility um, from turning to courts. But that's that's when um, another judge stepped in. Sorry, um, uh, I'm sorry. Let me interrupt here because we I would like right. us to come. Just what you're saying is so interesting, and I would like us to uh, combine it with some of the questions that are being asked of us. So one being is is the question of of free press, which there is this really interesting question: if there is a free press in Hungary, free in the sense that it is not uh, sort of like advocating the opposite either the government's view or the opposition, but one that really curates its own opinion and its own views. And it has it, it, it could be tied in a little bit to what's happening with the law. So is there an independent judicial system at this point? So as we are discussing these points, perhaps uh, let's try to address uh, this question too. Now, let's see, I think you wanted to jump in. So um, go ahead. Uh, yes, just before uh, answering this question, very, very briefly uh, to answer the previous question of what is going on with uh, with PSFA now. So one thing is the Diploma Saving Program Emergency Exit, but there's one very important aspect that with these partner universities, they are from Austria, Germany, Switzerland, and Poland, we are planning to establish a non-institutional institution that is translocal, transnational, and as independent of the local governments and their caprices uh, as possible we, because our partners uh, are wise enough and they can see this this populism going everywhere so it, it's in their interest as much as in ours to establish something that is not depending on on universities uh, as as for your question and and also filipano's question about the elections yes there is a free uh, press in Hungary, but it, it's not so accessible. I mean, the reach of the, the free and, and independent press is not comparable to to, to uh, what the the government uh, owned press can can reach. I, and by press, obviously, I mean the electronic me media and even, even the internet, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I hope all my partners have, a, have an answer to, to what Philip Arnold asked, but my very short answer is that there is no hope of, of turning the wheels back uh, fast, even if the elections come to our favor, I, uh, because these new rules that, that gave, as Ilvika explained, that gave uh, the huge national assets, including universities, uh, to, to, to a very small group of people, these laws cannot be just changed. So these, these, as I said, the boards that now control the universities, these boards are, are appointed for life. So that's not, not an easy question, even if the present opposition wins. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Philip's uh, question, so, oh, just go ahead, yes. And, and in, as, we are, as we are answering these last questions, uh, if we can also so address both uh, what Philip Arno asked, and, and which is about uh, can it all be reversed after the elections, which is going to take place this this uh, April, and simultaneously we have another questions we are which is Greg McDonald is asking if we are facing some of the same political and cultural tensions, for lack of a better term, in the U.S. Are there lessons you can share uh, share about creating effective resistance to similar anti-intellectual movements that might translate here? If so, what they would be? So just for uh, the sake of time, um, I would like um, to pass the word back to Ilikona, but if, if you can think about both uh, Philip's question and also Greg's question, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, one of the 
um, the forces of uh, of this movement was to really focus uh, on uh, uh, very clear uh, questions and articulate uh, point of views and never enter really in these general discussions about what's the situation in Hungary, what's the situation uh, in Eastern Europe and so on. Um, and I think this sort of humble approach that this is what we want to say and this is what we think right, um, uh, it has a power um, in the general discussion. Um, and what Nuri started to tell, and I understand that it seems a bit complicated, but I remember the total shock of, um, of this, um, um, this, this new um, heads and, and somehow uh, the government, um, because they, um, they thought it will be a very, very easy thing to win. Um, and perhaps there will be some lamenting and some shouting and some uh, protesting articles here and there, and that's it. And it became very, very, very difficult for them. And mostly because of this humble resilience. For example, these lawsuits, they never imagined uh, that uh, actually this bunch of uh, um, young students, uh, they will consult a lawyer. They will know uh, better than them um, um, the, the, the rules uh, they are referring to because they were so careless, so um, 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 despising in a, in a way uh, that sort of um, intellectual regard and seriousness of, of this group, because these are just young, young artist kids, you know. So somehow this sort of day by day struggle but that Nori tried to describe, um, it was um, a very, very frightening lesson to, um, uh, to the power and somehow I think it can be a very positive lesson for anyone uh, just not to attack, not to humiliate, not to uh, make fun of anyone, but just to very positively say this is not okay, this is what uh, we find right for this and this and this reason. So a, a simple, clear, uh, and noble way of communication, it became so rare that it has such a, such a great power. Um, it, it creates a lot of real freedom, not just uh, seemingly free space. Thank you so much, Yadiko. And, uh, and I know, Nori, you want to add something to this, but let me combine it with a, another question from the audience, which is, uh, how did the students and the university staff dealt with the police repression during the occupation? I feel like you can really briefly answer that one too. Again, we only have a couple of minutes, so let's keep this short, but thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, the police um, helped us um, throughout the occupation. Like they were really there for us throughout the protests, throughout the nights where you, you know guards were outside the building and they protected us in every time, every way. Um, law enforcement was uh, was by our sides. They were helping. What wasn't was the lawmakers, the government, and who made the the law to turn us into a private entity and rip us from the autonomous rights. But uh, police were there for us, and people from all professionals, lawyers were there for us, offering us their help. And I think what's really also just adding and um, really reflecting on what Ildiko said, it's values. We stood up for values. We never entered party politics. And I think when values can be as clear and as um, as, um, as reachable and persistent, 
resilience and values are the ones to key to freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laszlo. Would you give us the concluding words before uh, we... No, yes. no, not the concluding, but very shortly. Uh, another secret is that the, the powers uh, uh, tried to, to do all the, the usual power games and they didn't work because we didn't break uh, private bargains. We, we stood in unity and, and collectively and we made it very, very clear. Even the government's attempts on, on trying to, 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 uh, uh, to do private bargains. So it just didn't work. And I think that's a lesson anyone can, can learn. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, then maybe I'm going to give the, the concluding word before uh, we're going to uh, pass the baton back to Kevin that so from the outsiders and to some extent, for instance, I was an outsider as once upon a time, really long time ago, I myself was a student of the university, but unfortunately, um, at this point, uh, this community already very much took control of their own narrative, or fortunately, I should say, very much took control of the narrative of their of their protests, and it was very clearly regulated how much we, as those who are outside of this community, can support the the community. And what it showed to us, and what I don't think that we can often see is this radical claiming of freedom that of of we're gonna think of who we are we're gonna we're gonna define ourselves we're gonna we're gonna look into the laws we're gonna understand our place in this democracy and pursuing it in on every possible avenue so this really was truly a um, um a, a very powerful and very creative movement that even witnessing was just a great honor so thank you so much for all of the participants for joining us uh, uh laszlo ildiko nora and then uh kevin uh would you like to rejoin us yes thank you um it's uh always when i show up at the end the people who um uh go watch these series know that it means that we're almost done so i feel like kind of the wet blanket at the beach but um i really wanted to thank all three of the speakers and you aniko um for for this fabulous session i just i i've been scribbling down notes the whole time there are so many things that i would love to ask about too um it's just um i think the um you know, the, the clarity, transparency, unity idea um, and the, you know, humble resistance are ideas that that certainly um, came across to me and how those can be um, things that that work very well with art and protest. Um, I guess the, the one question that if I had time and it's unfair to ask it when we don't have time to get answers, but a question maybe to leave us with that. Um, I hope this is not the end of the conversation. Um, it has to do with um the question of i was very very taken with the idea that um you know there's this this radical democratic structure to how um things are organized and that if you have an idea we can help you uh, everyone is joining in to help um, realize um those those ideas but um you know, an issue that's come up in um, in other contexts in uh, New York, for example, um, uh, where where uh, similar kinds of things have have happened, is that well, you know, we kind of lose control of the message at that point, and um, there, you know, there's a certain uneasiness about what might come I, or openness to that, but that the notion that we're you know we're all individual human beings and we all are going to have our own different ideas as well, and how, how much to allow that difference to kind of emerge within a movement and not to allow it to kind of, you know, take things off track in a certain direction or not. Um, I was just very struck by um, the, the sense of unity, particularly when um, the, the, a larger public is then drawn into to it with the 30,000 demonstration. Obviously, a lot of people are coming in with, from a lot of different directions with a lot of different ideas. And how you know how comfortable can you be with with the with the kind of you know allowing all of those voices to be raised? It's a it's a fa fantastic question um, that I hope at some point we'll have a chance to to and I, uh, to talk about more. Um, uh, I would like to say that you know we are looking at organizing a an international conference around this in a couple of years, and so um, hopefully there'll be a possibility for some of you to join us and talk about questions like that, which have been coming up over and over again. Um, Nora, I see you have your hand up. 
Right, just to just to just a very brief answer to the question you you've raised, and it's a very great question because the answer is five, six, seven hours of debates, conversations, and listening to each other, and that's where we uh, can <laughs> reach a point at the end. But it cannot be skipped. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And, and one, one more sentence, and then the decision is accepted with, by everyone. Also, those who perhaps do not agree. They accept, okay, that's the decision of the community. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, thank you for that. And um, with that, I think I really need to let people go. Everyone's on busy schedules. And um, uh, just wanna thank you all again. Um, I want to just say, um, uh, you know, um, remind people that we have a lot of uh, exciting sessions coming up after this as well um, with Dred Scott coming um, next week, um, followed by um, Sarah Karimi, um, Afghan filmmaker, who's got um, some really exciting things. Uh, Laura Rykovich, who um, the ex uh, uh, former director of the Queens Museum, will be talking about how museums can be involved in cultural institutions in this sort of um, work. And finally, um, uh, coming up later, um, just confirming that uh, um, we have an exciting session with the Radical Press of Brazil and um, some of the street um, protesters there coming up soon. So if you um, are not on the mailing list and would like to keep in touch with what we're doing, just send an email to me, kevin.rep at yale.edu. And the last thing that I wanna say is that um, there will be a recording of this uh, session today um, posted onto YouTube and I will send an email out to everyone who registered to let you know when that will be available. So with that, um, thanks again to all of the panelists. Um, uh, thank you, Aniko, as well for organizing this and everyone have a great evening. And uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all at some point down the road.